Today is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. We commemorate St. Edward of Day's Mass, a preface, a preface of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, I brought a Roman Catholic magazine down, and I apologize. I just haven't got out any sooner than that. Uh, but it's available now. And also, uh, and also to take one and take it home and read it. And you teenagers, even, uh, I'd say take one and, and read it, of course. But keep one for yourself. Start building up a library of articles. Of uh, You maybe not have bookshelves of books and reference books, but start collecting these, start saving these, and go back and reread them. There's always some, just some good information. And the magazine is basically a lot of good uh, articles uh, written by priests years ago uh, covering various and sundry topics that are as applicable today as they were 50 or 100 years ago. And also, too, uh, I just look at the calendar the other day, yesterday, and All Souls Day and All Saints Day is coming up very shortly, so uh, the All Souls Day event envelopes are available. If you wish to fill them out, please do so. We've got next week and then on All Saints Day to get a return back. All Saints Day and All Souls Day, I'm planning on both days, will be uh, 1 o'clock Mass on All Saints Day and also 1 o'clock Mass on All Souls Day. So just please keep that in mind. But as far as the All Souls Day envelope, Please return them either next Mass or by all, no later than All Saints Day, if at all possible. The epistle appointed for today's Mass is taken from the epistle, first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Brethren, I give thanks to my God always for you, for the grace of God that is given, to you, given you in Jesus Christ, that in all things you are made rich in him, in all utterance, in all knowledge, as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that nothing is wanting to you in any grace, waiting for the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you unto the end, without crime, in the end, in the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel appointed for today's Mass, taking the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> At that time, Jesus, entering into a ship, passed over the water and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him one sick of the palsy and lying in a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the man sick of the palsy, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And behold, some of the scribes said within themselves, He blasphemeth. And Jesus saith, Jesus, seeing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts, whether it is easier to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the man sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he arose, went into his house, and the multitudes, seeing it, feared and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Behold, And behold, some of the scribes said within themselves, he blasphemeth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Just as a quick translation, if you will, uh, here in the English, in the Dewey, Dewey Reams, they talk about the palsy. If I were to ask any of you teenagers or younger ch uh, children what palsy is, uh, I wonder if you'd know what it is. What it actually it is, in the Latin, is very clear. It's nothing more than being paralyzed. If someone's paralyzed, of course, they can't move. So, But the translator is a palsy in which nothing more than once again paralysis. That being said, uh, the, scribes and the, uh, the scribes, as we mentioned in today's gospel, they were vehement that our Lord forgave sins. In fact, they said he blasphemes. They were just quite vehement about this. And in a way, uh, leastwise, they stood on principle. They stood on principle that they saw something being wrong. And then, of course, our Lord questioned him. He says, well, is it easier to do this or to, to heal him so he can walk? And then he healed the man. And uh, all the people were in admiration at it. Because there, now they, they've seen by the miracle being performed, they've seen there that, not just a prophet, but they've seen that our Lord had the power of God himself, that he could set aside nature's law and uh, supersede it. But today, today, going back to the scribes, they were, as I said, vehement. They said he blasphemes. I mean, you could just imagine them, if not just thinking, if they spoke out, it was probably with a certain amount of vehemence. Uh, but today... And not just today, but people have become very indifferent, indifferent. We can condemn the scribes for being what they were, and maybe they just didn't fully understand, lack of knowledge, whatever it might be, but at least wise, they took a stand. So those who don't take a stand, uh, they become very indifferent. And I'd, actually, I'd, actually, I'd like to talk about that today, because outside the Catholic Church, Probably the dogma that's prevalent among non-Catholics 
is a dogma of indifferentism, indifferentism. I don't want to put numbers to it, but could I say nine out of 10 non-Catholics? Maybe to a greater degree, Novus Ordo Catholics? Really, more or less think that one religion is good as another. And what do traditional, traditional Catholics think? Are they, are we, as traditional Catholics, are we infected with indifferentism too? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't imagine any one of us saying that the Lutheran religion or the Novus Ordo religion or whatever it might be is good as the Catholic religion. But maybe to a lesser degree, we have the same attitude, if you will, the same belief or dogma that doesn't make any difference. Add the words to it. Go to Mass or not, go to confession or not, go to communion or not, uh, practice the virtues or not, be charitable or not. Uh, are we indifferent in that regard? It doesn't make any difference whether I'm nice to this person or not, or I'm not, whether I'm charitable to this person or not, or whatever it might be. I, I don't know. But really, the refrain goes back to this, what difference does it make to what religion we belong? And usually they'll add the, add the, 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 the phrase, this, as long as you're a good person, now, I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. Indifferentism, uh, in itself, in a religious sense or in a, in a theological sense, will praise all religions as being more or less virtuous for one, and they'll point out that there's virtuous men in, in probably, probably every religion, one way or another. They'll say, look at all the virtuous men that are produced by this or that particular religion, whatever it might be. Uh, and they, in so doing so, they almost like they, they maintain a sort of a kindly, kindly tolerance uh, towards all beliefs, various creeds, uh, all the various churches, uh, even to the point where those who are indifferentists uh, almost denounce the Catholic Church as being bigoted or intolerant because she's infallible and maintains that infallibility that the church will not let us go down to private judgment, but rather is a standard that sets the standards and tells what we must believe based upon uh, the Catholic faith. Uh, people who are indifferent will, will likewise will, will explicitly say, well, there's a lot of good people. And says, are you going to condemn all those people? Because there's many roads, many roads, not leading to Rome, but many roads leading to the kingdom of, God, of heaven. And they would probably, one way or another, they would probably more believe that uh, any honest man uh, can travel any one of them, and if he has conviction, he'll probably be pleasing to Almighty God. Some, some such expressions that I've heard various uh, ways of being said that way. And the worst is you find people who are indifferent everywhere, whether it's the whole world is indifferent to religion in general, or even Catholics indifferent to very aspects, various aspects of the Catholic faith. Uh, for example, in educational matters, you'll find people throughout the world that they're very, um, very secular in this matter. This, this, one religion or one school is good as another. Private school is good as a public school. You could go on and on. All the things that doesn't make any difference. In political matters, probably the same thing. Uh, there, they'd, uh, indifferent people, people are indifferent. They'd probably want the, 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 the church to ignore religion. And what religions stay out of the out of the out of the state, stay out of the church, all the, or stay out of the, out of the uh, state altogether. Um, they would. So we, we see indifference it manifesting itself in various ways. But really, indifference comes down to the fact that they more or less believe all different creeds or all different religions, all different churches, are more or less all equally true. And maybe they probably deep down more or less believe our religions are equally false. And their, their acceptance or the rejection of this or that particular religion is unimportant as to what clothes we may put on in the morning or as important as what nationality are we. But being, un, being indifferent in, this indifferentism really leads to agnosticism. And in the end, it leads to unbelief. They don't really believe. They don't act upon their belief. 
uh, and therefore it'll lead to unbelief. If one does not, what's the expression? If you don't use it, you lose it type thing. But the Catholic Church condemns in unequivocal terms this belief of indifferentism. One cannot be indifferent. You cannot be indifferent whether it receives the sacraments or not. You can't remain indifferent whether the Lutheran religion is good as the Catholic religion. We can't remain indifferent and anything when it comes to a matter of principles, matter of morals, matter of the law, if you will. The Catholic Church asserts that this enemy of the church is indifferentism. And I suppose it goes back to what I was saying about the scribes. A man who hates Christianity in general, the Catholic Church in particular, uh, can, be, can be turned to love that church. St. Paul would be a prime example. Maybe these scribes in today's gospel where they, they vehemently come on, they say he, he blasphemes. But St. Paul himself was a persecutor of the church. But then what he said in retrospect after he converted, he says that he acted in ignorance or unbelief. And of course, after his conversion, his same vehemence was there, but now in love of the church, in, in love of Christ. It, almost w w without limit. So uh, a, a full-fledged indifferentist will declare that God is indifferent to truth. They would want him to believe that he's indifferent to truth. The mere fact that they'd say all religions are more or less equal is that, well, this religion says you have to have baptism, this religion says you don't. This one says that the bread and wine is now body and blood, the other just says it's just symbolic, it's, as if it does make any difference to God, simply because he himself is indifferent. If one were not indifferent, it makes a difference whether this is bread and wine, whether it is we receive the body and blood of Christ or whether we don't receive the body and blood of Christ. We can't be indifferent to this. We can't be indifferent such that we, we become inactive. We do nothing. We cannot act upon uh, the truth. An, ind an indifferent person will not act upon the truth, what he knows to be true. He says, I must do this, or I must believe this, I must go to this church, and then he do nothing? That's indifferentism uh, exemplified in that matter. But the, the church, by contrast, of course, God himself, is very definite, not indifferent. He is very definite. He's very de the church is very definite in his teachings. It requires an absolute faith uh, to all revelation and enforces these doctrines under pain of, uh, pain of sin. And you've heard me over the years go back to the quote our Lord said, it's something about the, the children of this world, in their, the children's generation in this world are, in the children's generation are wiser than the children's generation of the world, or whatever. It means simply that, simply that in natural things, oftentimes we're quite prudent. We're quite prudent. We're not indifferent. Uh, when it comes to our business difficulties, our business uh, relations, we're very, very astute about that. Uh, some people even sacrifice their health to their comfort in pursuit of money and make sure their business does make a go, spend hours on end, or they're, they're, they're convinced of one political party or another. They, they, they're, their preferment is made manifest by the way they conduct themselves, what they do to make sure someone might get elected or whatever it might be. Uh, and if someone's uh, very passionate about scientific things, uh, inventing something or finding some new cure for a disease, they will expend themselves. And th you could not accuse them of being indifferent to something that's of great importance to them. Yet we as Catholics, sometimes we become indifferent one way, <coughs> indifferent one way or another, and it manifests itself in our contact. It shows up. Because as we believe, we put it into practice. If I, if I believe that religion means nothing, then I won't practice my religion. If I believe that stop sign doesn't mean anything, I'll drive through the stop sign. So as we believe, so do we put it into practice as we live. But going back, going back to indifferentism itself, it probably dates back to, I suppose originally back to maybe Adam and Eve, maybe, or to Cain and Abel or something. But in history, probably the first place it really manifests would be during the 16th century when the extreme formula came out that faith alone saves, uh, or faith alone without any kind of works, or without any kind of good works saves. Uh, that was 400 years ago, 500 years ago, what it was. Now it's almost reversed itself and it comes down back this is faith, faith alone, faith alone uh, saves. Now it's like work alone, 
regardless of without any faith. Because they would say, well, there's a good, he or she is a good person. You're not going to condemn them to hell. So the fact they're a good person that means they're, they're good works. They're a good person. They're good works. Saves. It doesn't make a difference what they believe. It, it, it's, uh, it wasn't so serious. It would be almost humorous the fact that hundreds of years ago, it was like faith alone saves. You believe strongly and sin, or sin boldly, Luther, I believe, said, and believe more, more boldly. Uh, and that would save you. Now it's like, well, you do good works, and that will save you. Or put it, Luther actually said this. He says, believe right, and uh, he says, I don't care what you do. That's what Luther said. Now it says, do right, and we don't care what you believe. Just once again, they, they started changing it around. What they did, they, they took private judgment, which makes man's reason the supreme arbiter of what is true and what is not true, what is necessary and what is not necessary. Uh, and that was actually the, really the, the, the father of modernism, this private judgment, that we would set private judgment over the, the judgment of the church, the, the mother of all churches. In other words, in the 16th century, the revolt of the 16th, 16th century substituted the infallible church, the infallible scriptures, as interpreted by the church, uh, and turned into private opinion of what, church to, it sh what the church should profess, what the church should believe, and how the Bible should be interpreted. Uh, and of course, we know in history that within a few years, this teaching led to a number of contradictory versions of uh, Christian, uh, Catholic truth, Christian truth. And the problem is then at that point in time, those who didn't have the inclination, didn't have the time, didn't have the ability to study all of this, uh, would soon declare, and this is what the consequence was shortly after that, that it didn't really make any difference what man believed. One says we must do this, another says quite the opposite. Both they would de deem such that they'd even burn one another at stake, saying that you must believe this, and yet they themselves didn't put it into practice. Indifferentism, indifferentism leads to all kinds of evils, one kind or another. Leads to naturalism, leads, leads to modernism, uh, ultimately, it utterly denies that God made any kind of revelation to man whatsoever, or deny that Christ established a church, a definitely a teaching church with authority to teach, to sanctify, and to rule. And so the church has always condemned indifferentism. But the objection raised is that do you really believe then that all good men will go to hell? Well, the Catholic Church says this. The Catholic Church, and once again, it's, no, it's not indifference. The Catholic Church says there is no salvation outside the church. And one just can't be a, a nominal member of the church. One must be a practical member of the church, a practical Catholic, a practicing Catholic, if you will. But on the other hand, the, the church has always held, just as vehemently so, that no one will lose their soul except through their own fault because everyone has sufficient grace to save their soul. So the, the quandary, I suppose, that we place is that what happens if someone who just doesn't fully understand, St. Paul, for example, he just didn't, didn't have the knowledge. And would Christ condemn him? They have what they have, it comes down to, if they have what they call invincible ignorance. Invincible ignorance would be where someone cannot help being un, unknowing of some doctrine or some, some fact. So a three-year-old gets into a car, somehow a four-year-old gets in the car, starts the car, gets it in gear, and drives over somebody. No one would convict that little child of murder because they're invincibly ignorant. And that invincible ignorance could extend even when it comes to knowledge. You take someone raised in the middle of the desert or the jungle or someplace where they have no contact, no ability to know a supernatural truths that God revealed, because no one revealed it to them. God revealed it, but it wasn't told them. They can be invincibly ignorant of some of the attributes of God, for example. They can be ignorant of a number of things because just this is what this tribe did, these people did it, and they just never, they were, didn't have the ability to learn that there was one true church. Pope Pius IX says, that, he says, we must recognize with certainty that those who are in, in, in invincible ignorance, it can be, even an adult can be in certain subjects and be invincibly ignorant, he says, we must recognize with certainty that those who are in invincible ignorance of the true religion 
are not guilty in the eye of the Lord and who will presume to make out the limits of, of this ignorance according to the character and the diversity of the peoples, countries, minds. He, he says such people, they could save their soul. It goes back to the principle that no one will lose their soul except for through their own fault. But that is, that's not indifferentism. It's very specific, very, and so, but going back to what I said earlier, the church does condemn in, in, indifferentism. Uh, if it was just, use, just reason alone would say when one cannot be indifferent, especially to a lot of things. Doesn't, it, one cannot be indifferent whether we eat or not, or whether we take care of our health or not, or whether we drive the wrong side of the road or not, or the left side of the road as opposed to the right side of the road. And, we, reason alone say we can't be indifferent. There's a lot of things specifically we can't be indifferent about. Uh, and if we look to scripture, we likely say, well, you can't, scripture would condemn indifferentism. Our Lord is very, uh, at one point in the Old Testament, God says that the lukewarm, I suppose that would be equivalent to being indifferent, uh, be vomit, vomit out of his mouth. If we look at tradition itself, of mankind, much less the church, uh, it would condemn indifferentism. And the God of indifferentism, and people almost deify that almost, the God of indifferentism is not the God to be adored by rational men. God is essential, absolute, eternal truth. And truth does not change. He is likewise essential, absolute, and eternal holiness. And the God of truth and holiness cannot be equally pleased with truth and error, whether it makes a difference one believes this religion or that religion, belongs to this religion or that religion. God cannot be equally pleased with truth or error, with good or evil, as if there is no difference. To assert otherwise would be to say it doesn't, that God does not care what man believes, and that would be nothing short of blasphemy. And so a man indifferent to truth really push comes a shove, would, almost would be a liar. In other words, they know, one would know that this is not right. And yet to live that way, to act that way, it's almost like putting words into action. One, and, and once we go back to think that God could be indifferent to truth, if God, in fact, if, if in fact God were indifferent to truth, then he would have no right to any kind of homage of any thinking man, any rational man. And so it's probably, I'll just leave you with this, probably no wonder then that those who form such a low concept of God to think that he doesn't really care what we believe should end up denying him altogether. Indifferentism really, uh, to one degree or another, in, in, in full-blown expression, indifferentism is merely uh, atheism in disguise. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.